Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see me here in the corner? My name's Sharon Walpole. I'm from Career Map. Thank you all very much for joining us. And nice to see that everybody's eager to have a really good start for the afternoon. We've got a brilliant session today with our friends at Remit, Remit Training who are going to be talking to you about apprenticeships and hopefully be able to answer any and all the questions that you have. Uh, that's the lovely Gurdjit who's just joined us from Remit and she will also have her colleagues today, Laura, Erin and Andy. If everybody wants to give a quick hello to everyone out there in Hi, live everyone. events land. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. You'll see a chat box next to the screen <clears throat> if you haven't found it already. Please feel free throughout the presentation, which will be starting in a second, to put in any and all the questions that you have as we go along. We will gather up all the questions that you have, and when the presentation is finished, there'll be a live Q&A in the end to uh, answer any of the questions that you do have. The session is also being recorded, so if you want to share it or come back to it later, it will be up on careermap.co.uk forward slash careermap live in just a few days. But without much further ado, I'll hand over to my friends at Remit and I'll see you later at the Q&A. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Gurdjieff. Um, I'm here from Remit Training, and as you know, we're here with three of our colleagues here, Laura, Aaron, and Andy, um, and they are, we're all involved in different parts of Remit Training, whether it's with the employers and or the apprentices, so we're here to talk you through about how you can get the apprenticeship that you want to get to. So what are we going to talk about? Firstly, who's Remit Training? I think a number of people may not know what a training provider is and what um, relationship they have both with the apprenticeship and the employee. So we'll explain a little bit about that. We'll then go on to Sammer's story. Sammer is one of our current apprentices working with Coca-Cola and she's going to talk you through her journey, what she's finding really exciting, how that's really helping her career develop. We'll then go on to talk about why to do an apprenticeship what are the good reasons for doing one, what the benefits are, and actually what's it all about. Very often people aren't very familiar with it. It's not something that's very much talked about in schools. So we'll go into some of the detail about what you can expect to do when you do an apprenticeship. We'll then have a discussion about how apprenticeships are opportunities for everybody. Um, and we'll talk about how they can really open up opportunities that perhaps you might have thought were closed before. And then obviously the important bit, how you get an apprenticeship that you want will very clearly talk you through the next steps of what you need to do and also um, we'll share some links with you as well as where you can get further information and at the end we'd love your questions so anything you want to ask um, no question is a silly question we'd love to know and hear what it is that you want to know so that we can help you on your path to an apprenticeship so who are remit um, a number of people won't have heard of what a national training provider is. Um, very often you know about the employer because they employ you as the apprentice um, and you may even know about maybe going to college to do an apprenticeship. Um, but actually a national training provider is somebody who works alongside the employer to develop a training program that's right for them and then also works alongside the apprentice to make sure that they're getting the best training possible and that they're coached and skilled and supported so that they can progress along their qualification to be successful in their career. So who are we? Well, again, you won't know, you probably haven't heard of us, but we work with over 7,000 employers nationwide, and we've worked with over 40,000 apprentices over our time as well. So we are a nationwide company and we cover a huge breadth of apprenticeships. I've listed them here. So things that you may or may not be familiar with in terms of apprenticeships, so leadership skills, management apprenticeships, hospitality apprenticeships, IT, business, sales, food, retail care, automotive, and even marketing, which is my background. And what do we provide? Well, we have industry experts. So we have people who work in the in Remit who are experts in their area. So whether it's hospitality, whether it's retail, whether it's food, they've often worked in the industry, really got to a high level of skill, and they come out to train apprentices and work with employees to develop the programmes. Um, and we also have state-of-the-art facilities. So for our automotive provision, we have two state-of-the-art academies based in Derby, where our learners will come and train every few months. 
Um, and then what do we do? Well, we really work alongside employers. I said, this is all about making sure we get the right employers with the right skills that they need to grow for the future. And we help them recruit new apprentices or we help them upskill their existing employees. So apprenticeships are no longer just for um, school leavers. They can be for any age and for any stage of your career. So we're kind of that linchpin and we work really closely both with you as an apprentice to make sure you're getting all the right skills and support you need to get to the qualifications you want. And we work with the employer to make sure that they're getting the right skills to help their business grow. So who do we work with? Now, this is probably going to be more familiar with you to you in terms of the tribe of companies we work with. There's some brilliant names up here. And obviously, this is just a handful of the ones that we do work with. But you'll know some familiar names. So the Scania, Nando, Softcat, which are an amazing IT company. Um, we've got um, uh, MAN, Bidfood. We work with the NHS, Starbucks, and obviously Coca-Cola. And we'll go on in a second to look at the video from Sama. We're saying this is literally just a snapshot, but we also work with a lot of regional and local employers as well so if you um, are thinking oh these are all national companies we do actually work locally and regionally because there might be opportunities in your area that you want to pursue and again that will be something that Andy will talk about at the end of the presentation so if we then go to the video so here is Sama she's one of our apprentices with Coca-Cola European Partnerships and let's hear her story Hi everyone, my name is Summer Rafiq and I am a Business Administration Apprentice at Coca-Cola European Partners, which we call CCEP. Um, I started my apprenticeship in 2019 and I will be completing my apprenticeship in June 2021. I will be explaining you, to you today why I think an apprenticeship is a great way to start your career. So a little bit about myself. So, my journey to an apprenticeship. Um, I left school with uh, eight GCCs and I got six Cs and two Bs. And I went to sixth form for my first year where I studied business law and psychology. Um, I really struggled with one of my subjects and I kind of knew that if I was to continue, I would either have to pick up another subject in my second year or just leave altogether which is what I decided to do and I went to college where I studied a BTEC level three extended diploma in business. Um, this was a really good decision for myself because I felt like it was the right thing to do um, and I literally did not regret it one bit. While I was in college in my second year uh, teachers were sort of talking about university and personal statements and UCAS points and I kind of realised that actually I don't want to go to university and university wasn't for me. I'm more of a practical learner. I always apply what I learn straight away. So I just knew it would make more sense to definitely look at an apprenticeship or full time work. And the thing that I really liked about an apprenticeship was the fact that you get to still earn a qualification while you're working full time. I decided to go for the apprenticeship at Coca-Cola European Partners just because I mean, Coca-Cola is so like famous throughout the whole world. They're so well known. And I just knew that it would be a really great company to work with and start my career in and put me in like a really good position. Um, one of the things that I believe I did was really challenge that perception of not going to university and choosing that traditional route, which is what a lot of people tend to do. And I, I kind of didn't do that. And I decided to go with an apprenticeship. since I've started my apprenticeship I've been really lucky to learn so much and do two different roles so I've learned things from a new software called SAP in my role as a planning coordinator where I would order materials I've learned how to use Excel to a really high standard from doing reports and pivot tables I've independently worked on various projects from a quality project that I did to a recent environment project as well as learning about the fast moving consumer goods industry with a training course I did in November. My apprenticeship was advertised as a business administration apprenticeship where you get to do three different rotations within the supply chain. So the main thing that I was really interested in was learning three different roles and learning about supply chain and learning what I found best and where my skill set was suited to most where and where I could see myself working in the future. I've also had the chance to build on like my confidence and sort of get really good skills through networking. So 
you know, I can go to events and I can talk to different students and I can talk to parents really confidently. Whereas beforehand, I guess I was always a little bit more shy. Um, I've also learned how to prioritise my workload and meet deadlines, as well as showing really good teamwork in skills. So with my apprenticeship, I've been able to get involved with a lot of things, which has been a huge benefit. Um, and a few being I got to support CCP at various different career events. So one event at Google HQ, which was really fun. And also I got to go to the House of Commons during National Apprenticeship Week last year, which was honestly like something that I won't ever forget. I've also helped out with different assessment centres and interviews on site. So, you know, helped out with recruitment, which is something that I really enjoy. And um, I found it really um, in, in useful to sort of be involved in and see the process sort of behind the scenes. I've had case studies about me on various websites, as well as being asked to be part of the CCEP Inclusion and Diversity Catalyst Group in Europe. So there's about 15 of us in the group and a lot of the people on the group are directors and senior VPs um, and I'm the only apprentice. So I think it's given me a lot of exposure to senior members, um, colleagues and just being able to connect with a variety of different people from across the organisation. Um, a surprise has definitely been how manageable it has been to work and study towards a qualification. I think that's one thing that I was probably concerned about, not knowing how I'd be able to balance, you know, studying and working full time and a social life. But it's all been really great. I mean, I prioritise my workload and I plan when I want to be studying um, one day a week. And with that, my work slash study life balance is really good. Something that has been beyond my expectation is how the work I've been doing has been really valued and made a difference on site. So, you know, as an apprentice, you do get given a real job. You do get given um, real life things to do. You don't just get given like the stuff that nobody wants to get on with. And through this, by working hard and, you know, when your work gets recognised and someone says, oh, good job, it is really rewarding. As well as this, like I recently won a UK apprenticeship award, um, which was just a really huge achievement in my career. And it's something that I'm really proud to have done only one year in. So I really do believe that apprenticeships like have no limits, especially if you're willing to put that hard work in, you can literally achieve what, you, what you'd like. So going forward, um, my ambitions are to continue my career within supply chain. However, have a look into a future within HR as it's something that I am interested in and I feel like it's something that I'd be good at and I'd enjoy. So it's definitely on the cards for me to have a look at. Um, but with my apprenticeship, it has literally given me the opportunity to get that real life work experience and a qualification, meet with a variety of different people in the organisation, network with people externally from different businesses, get involved with loads of amazing opportunities, be a keen advocate for diversity and inclusion in the workplace, which is something that I am really passionate about, winning a UK apprenticeship award. Um, and it's also just made me realise that with hard work, you can achieve and exceed all of your goals and aspirations. And I think my apprenticeship has definitely opened a lot of doors for myself. Um, here's just a, some feedback that I've got from like my parents and my friends and a colleague. And a lot of them kind of just said things along the similar lines of, you know, they definitely look into apprenticeships and they definitely recommend apprenticeships going forward just because they've seen how useful it's been to me. So it's something that they definitely will talk about more often going forward. So my advice would definitely be to just go for it. I think apprenticeships are a really good way to start your career. You know, you earn a salary, you get your qualification and you get that work experience, which is so important from the get go. Um, just to do your research, to have a look at the career path that you want to go down, have a look at the career that you want to do and see if you can start your career off with an apprenticeship. So I know at CCEP, if you want to become an engineer, you can do an engineering apprenticeship and, you know, work your way from um, your first year up until your fourth year and become a qualified engineer at the end of it. So definitely see if your selected career route um, you can start off as an apprenticeship because it's just a fantastic way to start off as well as just keeping your options open. So don't always restrict yourself to one route. Have a look at different career paths. Have a look at different options um, because there might be something out there that you might love, but you won't ever consider it because you're so focused on that one thing. So for myself, I always wanted to go into a career in banking um, and I even did my work experience at Barclays, but I applied for an apprenticeship within supply chain and now 15 months later, I've learned so much and I've really, really enjoyed it and I can see myself working a future in supply chain. 
So thank you all so much for listening and I hope I've explained to you why doing an apprenticeship is a great way to start off your career. We're going to return back to the slides now. OK, so hi, everybody. I'm Laura Ogden. I work as the Learner Engagement Lead at Remit Training. So welcome to the presentation. Wasn't Sam as such an inspiration? I really enjoyed watching that video there. Can see everybody's questions that are coming through. So I'm hoping that the next few slides are going to answer those for you um, as we're going through. If there is any more, please keep tapping that question box. And as we're going through, we will answer as many as we can for you. OK. the next page there so why become an apprentice to become an apprentice um, the easiest definition that I can give to you is it's an opportunity for you to work have a full-time job earn so you're going to get a wage at the same time as well as learning a qualification um, it is an opportunity for you to work in a real work environment so you will be treated the same as all the other members of staff within the business and get the same perks and benefits that the employees would all get there as well. The training for an apprenticeship um, it is state of the art, it's actually designed in partnership with the actual employer in mind that you're going to be working with so we specialise it to make sure it meets industry needs and it is actually going to provide you the skills that you need for the industry moving forward so that longevity of a job moving forward it is there for you to keep and you will have those skills to stay there if possible. Um, lots of career choices there is loads of apprenticeship opportunities in a variety of fields remits as a training provider we offer a selection of programs which you'll be able to um, find out on a good it mentioned them in the previous slide there of some of the ones that we do um, but you know if that's not particularly the one that you want there is loads of apprenticeships out there as well which you can go into the opportunities for an apprenticeship they um, are for anybody who is finishing their GCSEs and come out of education all the way up to degrees so if you've completed a master's of degree you could then also still come and do an apprenticeship if that was what you wanted to do to get yourself into employment it's a great opportunity for you to be able to stand out from the crowd um, and it definitely helps you to secure that permanent role having that extra experience on your belt um, to actually say I can do the job as well as I know how to do it from a qualification point of view the apprenticeships themselves the government focus from last year um so from 2018 to 2019, there was actually 7, 742,400 people enrolled on an apprenticeship. So there's lots of people out there all doing the same qualifications. There isn't an upper age limit. Anybody can get involved in an apprenticeship. Um, and it's a great way for you to go to university. I know a few people are popping up with questions there to say, is there any loans? You know, am I going to get myself in debt by doing an apprenticeship? There is no loans with an apprenticeship. It's all funded for you by your employer. Um, and it is recognised for you to be able to go through with that qualification. There's also perks and benefits in terms of the National Apprenticeship um, NUS discounts. So if you went onto NUS websites, you can get a card that would give you discounts in an array of different food outlets and entertainment places when we're allowed to go back to doing those things. So let's take a look at what is an apprenticeship in more detail. An apprenticeship, as I've said, it is that job with um, full-time job with training opportunities alongside it. There's also a chance for you to um, do your study. So there's extra online virtual courses that you could get involved in alongside your qualification. As Summer mentioned, there is that work-life study balance. Um, so it is managing your time. You definitely get out of it what you put into it. So if you wanted that past merit or distinction, that extra work that you're doing behind the scenes is definitely going to get you those extra grades when you go to your end points assessments. Uh, it is an 
opportunity to earn while you learn. So you do get paid while you're doing that apprenticeship and it gives you that opportunity to start managing your money, um, budgeting, learning your finances um, and having that little bit of freedom to go out and do what you wanted to do with your own independent finances. Um, and also that one-to-one -one support. So I know a few people have been asking about maths and English. They've also been asking about um, any additional needs that they might have it's all individually tailored to you so it's not a classroom with 30 people all working together we will come and see you in your workplace and make sure that you're getting the support that you need for your qualification and an individual case by case basis when we're actually signing people onto those courses um, so yeah hopefully that all makes sense there Okay, so myths. Let's have a look at some of these myths. So we get quite a lot of frequently asked questions that come through here. So hopefully some of these are going to answer these questions that are popping up here. So are apprenticeships just for people who didn't do well at school? There's a bit of a stigma around apprenticeships, but actually no, it's available to everybody, all ages and all abilities. I have seen in the news recently that there's been somebody aged 75 who's just enrolled himself onto an apprenticeship, which is fantastic. You're never too old to learn new skills and to get involved in that. Second one across there, can I do an apprenticeship before or after instead of doing university? Yes, you can. Um, we would have to review case by case to make sure that you've not overstudied in a certain sector and you're repeating the same qualification again but definitely it's something that we could welcome and we would love to see people coming from apprenticeships onto our qualifications for apprenticeships and I know that the employers would definitely be looking for those people uh, likewise if you're looking at that from your stepping stones you've finished at 16 and you're wanting to do your apprenticeship right away you can do if you do a levels and then think right before going to uni, I now want to do an apprenticeship and get a little bit of industry experience. Wherever it's right for you is when you can start your apprenticeship and we will meet your needs around that. The biggest one here, there's lots of questions coming through here. What is the salary and what are the benefits? So the salary, the minimum that you can get paid, it tracks national um, national minimum wage. So if you're 16 to 18 and you're joining an apprenticeship, the minimum that you can earn is £4.15 per hour whilst doing your apprenticeship salary. You'll be entitled to paid holidays um, and all the terms and conditions that any other employee would have within that business. So if they had perks or benefits from that particular company, you would also be entitled to those whilst being an apprentice for that company. Um, you would have terms and conditions and be exactly the same as them. Um, hopefully that covers that for you. Do they, have a do they limit your career? No, I would absolutely disagree with that one. Um, they're actually a key part to employers. They're using the apprenticeships to upskill their current workforce so they actually uh, employers are seeing the value of apprenticeships to put people on them as part of their own cpd whilst working in the job but they're also using it as their recruitment channels you know they're wanting to expand their workforce and they're actually recruiting people into the business um, as part of apprenticeship programs so that they can learn their skills on the job is a really good way for you to get into the company that you're hoping to get into are they just manual jobs so again in my capacity i go around a lot of schools i do careers fairs and talk to a lot of people and there is that stigma that if i'm going to do an apprenticeship i'm just going to be a tradesperson not at all there is lawyers marketing it if you wanted to get into customer service particularly now um in the climate that we're in care health and social care is a massive uh, way of getting into the profession using an apprenticeship pathway um, also I've heard the stigma of being a, a tea and coffee maker you're not going to be the tea and coffee maker employers actually will grow this to have their staff being integral people within their business you heard in Sam's journey in the video previously she's on a board and a committee and she's making business critical decisions based on her personal experiences and they definitely welcome you into the workforce to do a lot more than making teas and coffees so this slide here I wanted to bring this slide forward um, to kind of give you a picture of what an apprenticeship looks like where would you go a lot of people have put on here am I just going to get the course and then not have a job at the end of it. This is your job. If you become their apprentice, you work for that company. Um, it's not just for the longevity of the programme, you are going to be doing the qualification. Start off um, 
at the level of your current education. So if you've finished school and you've got your GCSEs, you would be coming into an apprenticeship either at level two or at level three, based on the course that you choose. Each one has different entry requirements. Um, but typically at that level three, that course is equivalent to two A levels. So you're naturally progressing with your education and that course is typically within 12 months time. So you're going to be studying that a lot more faster than your peers would that are doing their A-levels because they take two years in education, whereas the advanced apprenticeship, you would be doing that in a shorter frame of time. You can then, there's no ceiling. You can go up as, you know, throughout those levels there with those higher apprenticeships up to a degree, bachelor's, master's equivalent there. So you can see those apprenticeships are going up. If you um, didn't get the grades that you were hoping for, or you found yourself out of employment at this moment in time and struggling to get back into a job, there's also traineeship opportunities that you can explore and look into to get yourself the work experience that's going to be critical for you, adding that to your CV to make you more attractive to those employers. Okay, so thank you everybody. I'm gonna pass you over to my colleague Aaron now. Hi, uh, thank you for that introduction, Laura. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Aaron Burns. Uh, I'm a senior business development manager for Remit, uh, and I work across the the country uh, in order to to do my role. Uh, I suppose the first question is, what is a business development manager? Uh, in essence, um, it has an element of sales to the role. Um, but I suppose that I my first point of call is always to challenge perceptions of apprenticeships and allow employers and um, to understand the benefits of apprenticeships the government fund the government funding that's available and also the the people that will be coming forward for apprenticeships and what they can offer to to a business um, I specialize in in IT predominantly um, but I have skills and knowledge across all the qualifications that we as a training provider um, deliver um, but I am a massive advocate uh, of diversity and inclusion uh, within education, full stop. Uh, it's a passion of mine. It's something that I push on Remit's behalf. So I'm speaking to employers about diversity and inclusion uh, and allowing opportunities for everybody. So within IT, which is obviously where I specialise, that could be um, simply down to gender uh, or race. Um, there is a massive skills gap uh, in IT, full stop. And what a skills gap means is that a lot of the experience and knowledge is with people of the uh, of an older age, and therefore, ultimately, um, those businesses will eventually lose that skill and knowledge if they don't um, put funds towards young people uh, and training them to to their required levels. As we're going to mention in the video um, soon, uh, we're looking at the the gender skills gap massively at the moment because there are. Um, shortage of, of women within IT and the tech industry uh, fully understands that so we'll discuss that in the next video but that again is um, is an, uh, an area in which we are really really pushing okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to lead you into uh, a video where myself Laura and a teacher uh, a teacher from a school in Nottingham where, where we are based um, will discuss three points And then we're a race against time. We've got 10 minutes, Chris. <laughs> okay, so as part of the challenging perceptions presentation, we wanted to introduce a partner to this presentation slideshow. So we've introduced um brought along Chris Brooke here. If you want to just do a short introduction, Chris, into your job role and what you do for us. Yeah, so I'm Chris Brooke and I work at uh, Ellis Guildford School and I've been assistant principal for so personal development, time, which is a focus really. on careers and supporting students to know their options okay, post 16, so really. Lovely, thank you. Welcome aboard. We so my first topic of agenda that I wanted us to discuss was show. education. So it's great to have you as part of the panel here. here. Um, can you give us an insight into young minds and what they're thinking when they are leaving school and their opportunities ahead of them? Yeah, I think we've got a conflict in education. So what's being pushed is outcomes, 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 which you know is one part of it. So okay, students you. are key about getting grades so and getting the grades that they need to go to wherever they want to do. But my personal view is that we aim to give the all the options to each student so that they can make the best 
informed choice they can about what they want to do when they leave Alice Guildford. And Aaron, have you come across from an employer's perspective what they're looking for when they're hiring apprentices? Yeah, I think that um, as business owners, the common misconception is what uh, apprentices are able to to achieve and deliver within the workplace. You know, there is a conception that uh, they may be not work ready. Um, you know, how do we how do we identify that and get them work ready from a school environment and and for them to propel into the actual working world or or the real world, as some may may um, call it, and also the fact that they have uh, an idea that an apprentice is potentially less reliable or more likely to call in sick than a, gen a generic employee, which is not the case. Uh, if the recruitment process is, is what it needs to be in terms of characteristics and the kind of people that you're looking to bring into the organisation, then the as much or as less uh, likely to, to be away from the business as, as anybody else. So we just need to make sure that that recruitment piece from, from our side and from the business's point of view is right. But it's about finding the correct characters from, from the school education system, really. Thank you. And with regards to the sort of people that are coming forward to programmes, I know Erin, you specialise in IT recruitment at mm. Remit Training for us. Are you seeing an uplift of girls that are coming into the um, programme? We're looking at women in tech and championing that from our perspective at head office. And also for yourself, Chris, have you seen a trend of girls coming into the industry over the last couple of years of choosing their options? Should I go first, Chris? Um, I think that you know, there's a massive push within IT, um, calling it the gender skills gap. There's a skills gap generically uh, in IT anyway, in which the, you know, a lot of the experience is, is legacy, legacy experience and businesses are struggling to understand how they can um, give that experience back and, and grow a team, which apprenticeships are now becoming to the forefront. However, the IT industry is um, predominant in struggling to uh, attract um, female um, apprentices or employees in general. So that's something that we're working on as, a, as an IT division. Um, that probably falls under the, the, you know, the diversity campaign that's going on as well. Um, so there's a lot of key touching points within IT that, that need a lot of work. So I'd just be interested to see from Chris's perspective um, what, what schools are, are really doing in order to sort of like attract women to, to tech or girls to tech. I think in terms of schools, all students at Ellis Guildford are given the same access to ICT from year seven to nine. Uh, however, females are less likely to choose it at year 10 to 11. Maybe this is because it's a male dominated course usually. So even if you did want to pick it as a female, you may be put off. Um, also, our ICT department, it's heavily male dominated. So again, the lack of role model. Uh, in addition, I think Aaron's touched on this, that the IT they use is not necessarily stuff that in that, that's in the curriculum that they already are great at using so you know our students are big on social media but that's not even touched upon in uh, IT at year 10 and 11 it's not getting into the skills that they use um, and a lack of role models and maneuverability in the curriculum are massive issues for enabling students but girls especially to be able to pick it. I think that I think that disconnect uh, is clear to see between schools, maybe even between schools and apprenticeships, and then that that leap into into the business environment. You know, the skills that are required at a business level, uh, Laura, and not necessarily the skills that are, are taught in in the education system at the school age. So I think that apprenticeships can be a sort of key bridge um, to allow those um, skills to be to be trained out. Uh, whilst earning a, an income so it is a, a great route for for young people it's just my job I suppose to educate both the the, ch the children and the parents in, in regards to the benefits of apprenticeships because I suppose a, a misconception is that apprenticeships are you know for manual roles um, or for, for students that haven't done well in school when in actual facts every sector in this country uh, has an apprenticeship qualification designed for it and therefore there is a route into to every business uh, if you know what areas to look in. 
fantastic. Thank you both of you. And in terms of recruitment, have you seen any, um, based on your own personal experiences as well as helping young people into employment um, and preparing them for such which, have you seen any bias or prejudice within the recruitment um, sector taking place when applying for jobs yourselves or coming across anything at all? For me personally, it's not been to do with gender, it's been more to do with perceptions and stereotypes. So I'm a PE teacher by trade um, and the perception is that PE teachers are not very clever and that's why they teach PE. So I've had to fight against that throughout just to get up to assistant principal, but it's never held me back because I've been driven to on by that to achieve what I want to. But other than that, no bias over here. Um, I suppose my um, opinion on that is slightly different, Laura. I think that there's a lot of boundaries that I've come across or that people that look like me have come across in terms of, you know, the ethnic and diverse um, barriers that you look at within the education system. Uh, it can be things such as um, having teachers or uh, head teachers that don't necessarily look like me, therefore they're potentially not as aspirational uh, as, it, as it could potentially be. Uh, it can break down into <clears throat> as, as finite detail as the subjects that we're, that we're learning in regards to, to history, um, geography maybe even, uh, and we're not talking about things that have maybe happened to, to people from the cultural backgrounds that, that I relate to a little bit more, um, but again that, that boils down to, to curriculum. Um, and then you have um, the generic, within recruitment anyway, you have the generic what we call subconscious biases, which is you know, people in business talk about we've got culture within this business but it's not in the archetypal form of, of cultural appropriation it's not about having a diverse workforce it's more sometimes about how the organization conducts itself and the people that are in, within that organization and therefore that culture actually means that there's a lot of people who think uh, or look uh, the same uh, and therefore when the recruiter whether internally or internal or external is recruiting they're looking for like for like people so that could be you know something as simple as a name or an area that they're from or or a religious belief maybe even so i think that there is a lot of subconscious bias within the recruitment process um, but it's difficult to to iron it out in some cases absolutely it's a lot of food for thought um we're going to open it up to a q and a at the end of the session today but i wanted to thank you both for your time is there anything that you wanted to bring to the table before we call this to a close i'm all right with that laura thank, thank you thank you very much both of you enjoy your afternoons bye see you later I think you need to get your mic back on. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a problem with the, um, these Zoom sessions. So I was saying that um, to summarise, um, first and foremost, I apologise for the technical issues that we had, including me not turning my mic on then. Um, but it, overall, Remit are a national training provider. Um, we work with employees, uh, employers, businesses in order to enable people opportunities within uh, apprenticeships. Uh, apprenticeships are open to all um, and we work really hard on our recruitment process to ensure equal opportunities. Um, we are passionate about opening doors um, to employees to allow to allow um, apprentices the opportunity within business but we understand that as a training provider we need to reach out to the people that are thinking about apprenticeships and build understanding and knowledge of the of the sector and the opportunities and a lot of questions um, about what apprenticeships are available and i suppose the simple answer is that there is an apprenticeship for every single job um, that you can think of it's just finding that opportunity and i suppose that's what uh, remit's role within society is at the moment we as a training provider need to understand everybody's individual journey uh, and we map that out with the employees 
and I'm getting a lot of feedback. So. We are mapping out um, learning journeys uh, in order to uh, enable both the business and the learners to understand exactly from month one to month 12, 15 or 24, uh, how uh, an apprenticeship is going to run and the things that you're going to learn in terms of the skills, uh, knowledge and behaviours. Um, we have a tailored learning platform, which means that people of all abilities are available for apprenticeships, but also that, you know, if there is any areas of focus that we need to really work on, we have the it's coaches and the tutors to guide uh, everybody through their individual um, learning journey, meaning that the apprenticeship is not generic. It's um, purely and simply tailored towards your, your learning. Um, and obviously, we are proud to be um, promoting equal opportunities um, within the workplace and within apprenticeships and within education. And we are working with schools in your area uh, and businesses in your area in order to uh, enable that transition from um, the, the work, the school life to to a working lifestyle. Uh, I will now pass you over to Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so yeah, I'm Andy. I'm the team leader for the automotive recruitment team. So if you're looking at becoming sort of a mechanic through remit training, you'll speak to me or my team at some point. So. Obviously, if we've got an employer who's looking for a position, uh, we'll advertise a vacancy, find candidates, obviously try and match them up with the correct one. Or if we get candidates who register our system looking for a position, obviously we'll give them sort of help and guidance with the application, uh, as well as obviously getting in touch if stuff, you know, if vacancies come up in their area. So I'm just going to be guiding you through how to apply for an apprenticeship and just a few things to keep an eye out for when you're making your application. So first, how to apply. It is obviously, as Laura and I were saying earlier, it is a full time job employed by the company. So you apply for it the same as you do sort of most other jobs. So obviously, you know, creating a CV, find an apprenticeship vacancy. And obviously, at the end of my part, I'll provide a few slides, obviously, you know, with obviously our job board as well as sort of career maps and the National Apprenticeships job board on there. Um, obviously, you'd make the application and submit your CV. Step four, successful candidates being invited to an interview. Now, obviously, we appreciate that for a lot of people looking for an apprenticeship, this will be the first job that they're going to be going for. So we're not just uh, we're not just going to throw you, in, throw you in the deep end. Obviously, our team, they'll sort of give you a bit of guidance. So if they notice any issues with your CV, they'll help you improve that. Um, obviously, let you know what, what sort of things to do and get you prepped ready for, obviously, the final step, going for your interview with the company themselves. So, um, so the first bit I'm going to go through is sort of some feedback that we get from employers, both for people who have been successful and for people who have been unsuccessful. Um, so this first page, what are employers looking for? Now, all of these, this is sort of genuine feedback we've had from employers. Um, and you will sort of start to notice a trend as you look through, but as you look through both this and the sort of feedback for the unsuccessful people. So... Obviously, clearly done their research and know as much about the company as I did. Um, anybody who's had any sort of coaching or interview preparation will know one of the one of the first things I'll ask you to do is go on the company's website. Uh, obviously, you know, do a bit of research and looking into the company. Try and learn as much as you can about them. Um, other feedback they've got is you could tell this is what they wanted to do as a career. Um, <coughs> That is one of the main things that they're looking for. Um, at the end of the day, obviously, if this company is looking at putting sort of three years and time and effort into training, they want to make sure, you know, that it's going to somebody who really wants to do it. You know, somebody who is sort of looking at developing sort of long-term skill and career with them. Um, then you've got, although the other candidate had better technical skills, this candidate seemed to want the role more. Obviously, in automotive, that is something I do come across quite a bit. Um, at the end of the day, for example, using... My experience, if you're going for a mechanic apprenticeship, they're not expecting you to go in there knowing how to fix a car. That's what the apprenticeship is for. And then underneath that, obviously, the final one, smartly dressed, had answers and questions prepared. You could tell they'd done more preparation than the others. Um, this is all stuff that my team would advise you on as they're, you know, obviously, as they're helping you with your application. 
Um, a lot of a lot of this good feedback is basically coming directly back to showing effort and enthusiasm for the role. At the end of the day, all the sort of skills and behaviours needed for the apprentice are needed to do the job once you're qualified they can teach you that what they can't give you is an actual desire to do that career and do that role so on the flip side i'm just going to go on to obviously feedback we've had from successful candidates now the first four are surprisingly common so you get they didn't know why they wanted the job this is Number one question you need to be provided for, because pretty much the first question you get asked in any interview is, well, why do you want to do this apprenticeship? And you'd be surprised how many times the company come back to us and the answer they got was, I don't know. Once again, going back to, I'll say, for example, in the automotive, the apprenticeship's up to sort of three years, and they want to make sure that you're as committed to the apprenticeship as they are. Um, they showed up in a jeans and T-shirt. Uh, obviously, especially in the automotive trade, there's a lot of roles where basically 99% of the time you'll you'll never wear a shirt and trousers and everything for the job, but still show up for one in the interview. Um, once again, it's not so much that it, it doesn't show, you know, doesn't make any comments on your ability to do the job, but it does show that you, you know, that you're interested enough in the role to put in that little bit of extra effort. Um, obviously, the next bit, following on from the bit of feedback on the other side, didn't know anything about the company. Um, once again, as much as asking, why do you why do you want this job? Pretty much the next question they'll ask is, well, what do you know about us? Um, once again, for the sake of spending 10, 20 minutes on their website, learning a few facts, it once again shows that enthusiasm, shows that desire for the role. The fourth one may seem self-explanatory, but once again, you'd be surprised how often we get this. Um, going and enrolled for an apprenticeship, they will ask, what do you want to be doing in a few years? How do you see your career going? And the number of times where people say, you know, oh, I want to be a plumber or I want to be a joiner or I want to go work on the railways or basically they'll say, they'll straight up tell the company that they want to do a career in a different industry and then wonder why they don't why they don't get the job unfortunately i say that happens far more than it should and then the bottom two bits of feedback i know full well that they both contradict each other um they are in there to make a good point though so we have had companies turn down a learner because obviously they've never worked they've never worked on a car or engine before i say going back to where my experience lies um, you know, what I mean, they're looking for somebody who's maybe done a bit of work experience or somebody, you know, maybe had a, had a motorbike when they were a kid and sort of worked on that. And then we've had some who's turned people down because they've got too much mechanic knowledge. Um, their, their sort of reasoning is that they don't want to have to train out other people's bad habits. They're looking for a clean slate. Now, I left those two in there because it sort of highlights a point um, that just because two companies are looking for an apprentice in the same role doesn't mean they're looking for the same candidate or even a similar candidate. So obviously, if you're speaking to us about a vacancy, the recruiter that you're speaking to will have already spoken to the employer, will, you know what I mean, we've got to know them and will have got an idea on what it is that you're, on what it is that you're looking for and what it is, sorry, that they're looking for. And obviously, they'll give you sort of advice and guidance on how to prepare for it. So if you have got your recruiter saying this guy's a bit more professional than normal, so obviously, you know, try and convey that in the apprenticeship, listen to them. They've done this hundreds of times and at the end of the day, they are trying to help you. <laughs> Pardon me. So obviously, so on this next page, obviously, just going to a few further bits on how to stand out from the crowd when you are, obviously when you are applying for an apprenticeship. So once again, something I've mentioned two, twice already, research the company, especially with a lot of your larger companies where they'll have, um, where they'll have sort of their, they'll have sort of the corporate visions, they'll have sort of company values and stuff. Uh, knowing them going into the interview, I've never known an employer who's not been impressed by someone who's done their research. Um, 
obviously with this get relevant experience um obviously it's not saying that you have to have gone and done the job so that you don't need training um but a bit of work experience obviously you know if you're in your last year of school see if you can get sort of a couple of weeks work experience in that industry even over summer seeing if there's somebody just looking for help on saturdays something like that you know i mean just to once again get you used to the industry um <coughs> obviously under that make an impression what you write what you wear and how you behave um obviously once again there are there are a lot of people who will never even get the chance to go to interview um because of what they write um as i say on a cvs for example you'd be surprised how many cvs we get that haven't been spell checked it's it's a sort of number one first thing you're supposed to do but the number we get where it's just covered in the red lines um obviously we won't reject that obviously once again we'll try and work with you and let you know how to improve it um obviously and what you wear and how you behave once again obviously the what you wear in our industry it's more sort of you know just showing that you're willing to make that extra effort but how you behave is what they are looking for once again they're not looking for somebody who knows how to do the job that's what the apprenticeship's for they're looking for somebody who wants to learn how to do it <laughs> and then obviously following on from that as i was saying before get advice from uh, from the recruiter that you're speaking to nine times out of ten they will know the company quite well and their advice can make the difference between getting the job and not getting it once again the number of times i've seen i've seen people in my team give all the advice in the world somebody's decided to do it their own way and surprisingly the one who listened to us got the job so obviously i hope that sort of covered a few of the bits that obviously for employees to be looking for um so what to do next if you're obviously if you are wanting to apply so as well as obviously career map who's hosting this session for us uh you've got our website uh remit just apply.co.uk um this is our own job board obviously all our vacancies go on there um obviously from here then they will go on to career map but you can go go onto there create a profile and then you can look through any vacancies at remit uh that we advertise and sort of apply directly there's also the national apprenticeship service website so pretty much every training provider will post any vacancy they get there so that's always a good place to look for as well and point three finding your own apprenticeship um it may sound like the old the very old school way of doing it but you'd be surprised how often it works um as i say there are still some employers who who are being pressed by those who just put the extra effort to go in and obviously go out and see them. Obviously, not something that you can do at the moment, unfortunately, but obviously once the lockdown's over, um, so, you know, and you are able to sort of go out a bit more, then, you know what I mean, there's nothing to stop you getting a few CVs, putting on sort of shirt and trousers, going around sort of local companies, seeing if any of them would be willing to take an apprentice, or obviously in the current situation, Obviously, even just doing a Google search for people in that industry in your area and giving them a ring round. Um, as I say, I've we work with sort of a couple of dozen employers who will never advertise an apprenticeship, but they'll take one on sort of every couple of years when somebody goes up and asks them. Um, and then obviously at the bottom, we've got sort of you know a couple more videos with a bit more information and a few more frequently asked questions. So hopefully that's sort of covered most of the information regarding obviously what employers are looking for how to how to apply for apprenticeship vacancies um and i think we're just about ready for the q a excellent presentation thank you everybody for taking the time for uh going through in such detail and thank you to our lovely lovely audience who's all out there desperate with loads of questions we've had quite a lot coming through the chat so i'll help summarize some of these so we get some answers out to you and uh, thank you for, for popping your questions in if you've got any more questions while we're going through feel free to add them so let's get straight into it we had quite a lot of specific questions about types of apprenticeships so what i'm going to do
is uh, from Amelia, from Christopher, from Millie, from Randy, and uh, a few others. They asked, I'll just list the types of apprenticeships that they've uh, listed. So they've asked, do you do them in gaming? Do you do it in physical education? Do you do it in law? Do you do apprenticeships in engineering? Do you do drama? And do you do legal? So that's quite a wide breadth. And I think it throws up the question about, do you actually think that uh, there's two ways to go about it, knowing specifically what you want and also being open to what might be out there? Okay. Um, well, I can... um, so in terms of specifics, I think of the ones that people have listed, um, we don't do a number of those, but that's where you can absolutely use the National Apprenticeship Service website to find those. Um, when it comes to engineering, our focus is around automotive. And what we do have is a number of our really large clients like Scania and MAN and FCA are looking for people with very strong engineering type skills to work in the automotive industry. So that's how we would approach the engineering perspective. Um, but in terms of others, I think people mentioned such as um, legal, feel free to have a look at National Apprenticeship website, which will help you out in that area. Great. And uh, we were also asked by a couple of, by a couple of the, uh, young people out there that, can you travel? Clearly that's an issue at the moment with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, when the world changes and we're a little bit more of a, a blended learning world or back to reality, uh, is that a thing? Shall I take that one? Um, in terms of travel, and, and again, I'm not entirely sure whether the person is referencing UK travel or international travel there. Um, that will be subject, I guess, to the employer in terms of their apprenticeship programme and the role that they've got within their business. So if they happen to have a role that does require the individual to travel as part, naturally part of that role, then that would make sense. It's not built into the programme as such. It's built into the employer's definition of that job role. Right. And if I'll come in right. just in case on about the obviously the academy with the automotive side. So obviously with some of the automotive apprenticeships, in the usual world, you'd be training for a couple of months and then you'd be going away to our academy for up to sort of five week, five, one week blocks each year. Obviously, in the current situation, it is closed down and we haven't do a lot of training remotely. Um, and obviously we are obviously that's all sort of changing each and every time we're sort of getting update from government advice. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we've not got any learners travelling up to the academy, but it is obviously hopefully something we'd like to get an open, back opened up as soon as possible. Great. We had quite a lot of string of questions um, about apprenticeships that I think you might have touched on in your presentation, but it's worth answering the questions. So I'll, I'll go through. Uh, there should be quite a quick counter through. Uh, Aslin asked, um, can... Um, can you do an apprenticeship if you are a non-UK or an international student? Um, right. Sorry, go on, Andy. I was about to say, I know the basic eligibility, but I would always check the gov.uk website because there are quite a few exceptions that I do not have memorised. Currently, you need to be, a, to be an EEA citizen and I've been resident in the EEA for the past three years. Um, or I believe it's have right to work in England. Perfect. Uh, okay. Nicola wants to know, that, will they get a job after their apprenticeship? And what kind of support do you offer? Um, well, all the apprenticeships we advertise for are for full-time jobs once the, once the apprenticeship training is completed. Great. Um, and Jaris asks, uh, do English and maths matter? And if we don't know what we want to do, will you guide us on what the options are that would suit us? Um, with regards to English and maths, um, they are needed. Um, as part of any sort of level three apprenticeship, for example, you will need to sort of pass level two functional skills in English and maths, which is uh, sort of C grade or four grade now, so the equivalent. Um, so with ourselves, obviously we do have functional skills tutors. So if you're not at that level, obviously they'll work with you as part of the apprenticeship to um, to get those skills up. And so what was the second? Oh yeah, sorry. And yeah, regarding if you're not 
entirely sure what you want to do. Um, yeah, then, yeah, obviously speak to your recruiters. They're more than happy to give you, obviously, as much information as they can and information regarding the course. Um, at the end of the day, we're not, you know I mean? We're not just trying to put anybody into any company here. Um, obviously, all the guys will tell you, Remit's big focus is, obviously, any apprentice we put in there is there for the long haul. Great. Um the other thing I just want to add to that, I think, is from people who might have listened to Sam's story, was that she went in as a business administrative um, apprentice, but the scope of what she has done has been so broad that actually I think it's worth, when you are thinking of something, having that broad perspective, and then those kind of conversations when you are looking to approach an employer or have a conversation with an employer, you can look at how, how broad some of these roles really are. So what immediately may seem like a, something in your head and a perception of what a type of role might be it might be very different when you start the conversation absolutely it's like any job isn't it when you start a job and the employer gets to know you a bit better sometimes things change and careers aren't always just a linear path sometimes we we take little diversions along the way that's part of uh, the world of work i think um we've got uh, two questions that are a bit related uh elizabeth asks uh, is there an age limit? And Sam asks, can you do an apprenticeship if you've dropped out of uni? Okay, so with the age limit section, the apprenticeships are available for people that have finished their final year of high school. So typically you'd be around the age of um, 16, but you don't have to wait till your 16th birthday. If you're still 15, but you've finished education that year, you can enroll onto your apprenticeship um, after the, um, there's a cutoff date that'll appear throughout that year when you're able to enroll onto your apprenticeship that's we'll be able to advise you on, on that start date sorry sorry the cutoff point we can enroll learners after the final friday in june that they finish school in the there end. we go um and then what was the second question sorry the second question is can you do an apprenticeship if you've dropped out of uni absolutely so um obviously it would depend on the employer's understanding of your commitment and if you can explain your reasoning as to why you've not decided to do that qualification through to the end and we can portray that through to the employer we'd be able to put you onto an apprenticeship and guide you in your career dreams to get that off the ground really for you so we would be able to take you further forward what you would need to look at is that you've not over qualified in a certain subject knowledge field for you to do the apprenticeship if it's in the same sector, if that makes sense. Great. Well, I think we've covered all the questions. It's been a really informative session. Apologies for any technical details, uh, issues that we might have had, but that will all be sorted be in the recording of this edition that is going to be available on careermap.co.uk forward slash careermap live. Before we sign off, is there any final words from Team Remit that you'd like to uh, add before we say goodbye to our lovely audience? We look forward to your applications, everybody, and hearing from you on your journeys. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a big thank you for me, Sharon Walpole from CareerMap, and a uh, farewell to, from Team Remit. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. And thank you everybody for joining us and all your questions. We hope you have a really lovely afternoon.